Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Now you may be seated. Now I am so blessed to be here again. I, I, I can't recollect how was here last year. Yes, sir. You know, and that we had a great time in this presence, in the presence of the Most High God. Now, today is day ninth this year, isn't it? I'm not sure you've been day nine. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm not sure you've been blessed. You've been part of this day nine days so far, and you've been blessed. Why don't you just lift up your voice and say, God, thank you so far. God, thank, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You've been faithful to me. You've been great to me. I appreciate. I appreciate this, Lord. Yes. Amen and amen. Now you hear you. You have a testimony. The Lord has been a blessing to you these past nine days. He has touched you yes. in a unique and specific way. Let me see your hand, please. Thank you. The Lord has blessed you. Yes. And you don't want to keep quiet about it. Let me see that hand. All right, wave, wave it up to him. Say, Lord, I thank you. Now be specific now. If he has blessed you, say, Lord, thank you for blessing me in this area. You touched my finances. You touched my heart. You touched my family. Go ahead and talk to God about it. Express gratitude. I know you're here to receive more. Why don't you show some appreciation for what he has done before? You know, he's, he blessed you. He blessed you. He revealed himself to you. He poured his grace upon you. Say, Lord, thank you for it. I'm alive. I'm breathing. I am sound, body, soul, and spirit. I am grateful for that, Lord God. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Can someone say a loud amen there? Amen. It's a pleasure to be here again. And I want to thank God for my good friend. You know, Pastor Johnny Amos and his wife and all the leaders and the elders in this house could please put your hands together for them. Please celebrate them for me. Praise the Lord. You know, this man is a worshiper. If there be anything, if he's on the keyboard and he's leading worship, I want to be there. I will never forget that is this particular retreat that we went as G Ken, you know, about a couple of years ago, you know, and he just led us to the presence of the Lord. You know, he had no idea, you know, what he did. Well, when we had that meeting, we prayed, we had the session, but when we went back to the rooms, I couldn't sleep. You know, he took me so much to the presence of the Lord that I couldn't recover from it. So much so at about 3 a.m., maybe 2 a.m. in the morning, I had to get up, you know, go away from the rest of the group, and I was there till daybreak, you know. So could you please celebrate the grace of God upon this vessel of the King of Glory? Come on, yeah. put your hands together, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory yeah. yeah. Praise the Lord. Now, let me say this. Don't take lightly the words that come from his mouth. Each time he's under that unction, when he's praising, he's leading worship and stuff like that. Even if he's joking, even if he's just cracking a joke, take it seriously. The man is anointed for that. And the Lord God will continue to use you, sir, in Jesus' name. Now, the theme for these 10 days in the presence of the Lord is taken from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's one of my favorite scriptures. And I would like that we all read it, if you can open your Bibles to that. Yes. And uh, happy Pentecost Day tomorrow, okay? All right. In advance. All right. Ten days. I can imagine on the day of Pentecost, you know, the Spirit of the Lord kept building up the momentum. You know, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, <laughs> six, seven, eight, and nine. Ah, I can tell you. I know the glory of the Lord will descend among us tonight. Come on. But I can't wait for what is going to happen tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Come on, tell somebody it's Pentecost Day tomorrow. It's Pentecost Day tomorrow. Come on, you're going to help me tell somebody else. It's Pentecost Day tomorrow. Pentecost Day tomorrow. All right. And the Bible says it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never fails. He doesn't faint. He is never weary. He is just solidly the same. Acts 1.8, I read. 
The Bible says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? Yes. And I'm sure, you know, we've had some teachers coming by, you know, teaching and sharing on this, especially my brother yesterday, Alfred. He probably dealt with it. You know, talking about Pentecost, I was informed, and that we thank God for that. Yes. You see, I just want to tell you here right now that the assignment of the Holy Spirit in your life is to help you fulfill God-given mandate that is given to you. All right? Yes. That scripture is straightforward. Mm -hmm. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, all right? And then you're going to be my witness. Being a witness to God or unto God or for God is fulfilling a definite purpose in life. Mm. See, often we define witness as bearing witness, telling someone about someone. That's so true. That's important. But being an effective witness for King of Glory is not limited to that. Being a witness is being who you are in the light of the expectation of your creator. My God. So people can see, whoa, she is exactly what God made her to be. Yeah. Remember when his voice came unto concerning Jesus Christ, he said, hey guys, this is my beloved son my God. in whom I am placed. It doesn't matter what Jesus was doing. Whether it was healing or laying hands or witnessing or preaching, all those things, they do come. But when you live in the light of his true expectation for you, then you are an effective witness. My God. May you be one. That's a prayer. Say amen to that. Amen. I say, well, may you be a, an effective witness in the name of Jesus. Yes. All right. And that's what Holy Spirit came to help you to do. Today, I want to share about the empowering presence of the Spirit of God in your life. Now, we understand so many things. We've been told about He's the top person of the Trinity, He's a great one, He's God in the Spirit. His presence is with us. So, I'm not here to teach about Him. But let's talk about because He's present in my life, what should I expect? What should be my expectation? He's here to help you fulfill your part of Father's agenda in this life, in spite or despite of anything, no matter what. You see, let me leave that for a second and then we'll come back to that. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus challenged with the believers, with the disciples, with those that identify with him, is mainly that they didn't understand the capacity that is bestowed upon them by the virtue of grace and their faith in him. They didn't get it. Mm -hmm. On many occasions, Jesus Christ will rebuke them and say, look, for how long am I going to be with you that you still couldn't do that? No, don't you know that? In other words, his expectation concerning them is right here. But their performance, their effectiveness was right here. Praise God. They were struggling. So he's challenged with the disciples. When I still talk about disciples, I'm talking about the committed ones, those that are sold out to him. Yes. I'm not talking about strangers. I'm not talking about nominal Christians. I'm talking about those that already left everything and followed him. In other words, I'm talking about you. If you have made that decision, if you are here and you say, Jesus, I'm all for you. I want to live for you. I, I just want to go wherever you want to send me. I am ready to go anywhere and do anything for you. Then this message is for you here today. All right. So Jesus challenged with you and I as believers is because we don't live up to that level that he expects of us, most often. You see, it's easy for us to confess some things that we have come to know in the Bible. For example, 
that we are children of God. Amen. I mean, first of all, you are a child of God. Okay? That we are joint heirs with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, if you, you agree that you are joint here with the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. praise God. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Yes. I mean, first of all, you agree with me on that one. Yes. Praise God. But unfortunately, when it comes to where the rubber meets the roads, when we are faced with some challenges, when it, there is a demand on that grace, that confession, that which we believe we, we are, when there is a demand on it, we back down. We chicken out. We come up with excuses and explanations. He said, that if you believe, you lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. When it comes to doing that, we say, ah, well, you see, you know what, maybe we, I need to fast more, maybe I need to do this. We come with so many excuses and explanations. Praise God. All right? And uh, I, I don't want to blame you for that, but let's, let's see why. Let's see. Is there anything we can do? And uh, the only reason I can come up with is that our environments, our situations, our culture, the things we've been exposed to mm -hmm. has reprogrammed us. Mm. We have lost our true identity. Now, let me ask you a question real quick. Sir, can you come closer to me? I don't want to, uh, maybe I should come. I'm going to ask you a question and then you just answer. Who are you? I'm John Sloss, the son of the Most High God. Okay. I am John Sloss. Okay, you may be sorry, sir. Now, the description, I love the fact that he puts the son of the most high God. That's good. But then he started with I am. But right there in the middle, he defined himself by his name. If I ask someone, who are you? Well, if I keep asking him, your name isn't exactly who you really are. If I ask you again, who are you? You probably may think, okay, maybe I should talk about my profession. I am a carpenter. Or I am a preacher. Uh, let's do that again. Who are you? Um, I'm an immigrant. Who are you? I am black. You jump to race. Your ideology. I'm a pragmatist. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Oh, you just, you know, whatever it is. Uh, no, you even define yourself by your affluence. I'm a millionaire, if you don't know. I just want to brag a little bit about that. Oh, now I'm poor because I don't have what they had. So we tend to define ourselves by all the things we encountered when we showed up here on earth. We've been programmed by culture, by race, by values, by the things our parents exposed us to, and so many things we've been through in our lives. Yes, yes. The environment, the circumstances, the ups and downs, the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly things that happen to ourselves. Oh yes, I am abused when I was young. I am like this because so, 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 so happened in my life. So the bottom line is this, we've been programmed by so many things that we've been through in life. But I want you to pay attention to this. Everything you can even say about who you are to describe yourself, they are stuff that happened to you when you showed up here on earth. If the scripture is anything to go by, to go by with, you know, to understand, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, let me read that very quickly, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. There are three things I need you to please pay attention to. Number one, you exist before you were born. You've been before the earth, before your time here. 
before your dad and mom would come together in the body, you know, before you were born here or there, whatever it is, you exist. Otherwise, if that's not true, then God is a liar. We can assure you he's not. He said, before you were born, I knew you. If you were known, Hallelujah. if you already had an identity, then there is someone, there is a definition of who you are before you were born. Yeah. So you cannot come here and begin to tell me your, so, so, you know, this is the name that was given to you because it was given to you. That's not you. Yes. That's good. You were born black because you were born black, but you've been before you became black or white. Or you were telling me of the culture you were born with, maybe I'm Arab or I'm African, forget about all that. Yeah. You've been before then. Number two thing is this, you got a purpose before you showed up on earth. Everything about you is already made complete. Yes. Number one, you exist and God testified to that. I knew you. You are not a, you know, a misnomer and a coincidence or an accident or something that just happened. No. When, before your parents came, got together, we've been together. I know you. And you had a purpose. And number three, you were empowered already. You didn't get on earth and then, oh, you know, I need power, I need this. No, no, you're just wasting your time. You may go to the north or <laughs> south or east or west. I need to be empowered. I need power. I need... Shut up. Sit down. You've been empowered before you were born. So my question is this, who are you? Unless you redefine who you are, you discover who you truly are, you can never operate in the fullness of the power and the authority that are yours before you were born. Woo! You know, the truth is here that when he responded, he gave us a clue. He told us of his source. And if, if I had asked you the same question, you probably would do the same. Can you tell me who you are again one more time, please? Yeah, my name is John Slus, I'm the son of the most I got. I said, let me ask that question, and then you respond the way you're supposed to. I said, who are you? <laughs> no, no, you told me before, I just want to hear it one more time. That's the name now. Now, you see, before you mentioned the name, you said, I am. That's a clue as to who you are. Every human being, including you, there is no way you can tell anybody who you are before those two instances. Come on, Nothing precedes I am. Outside I am, you don't exist. You've been doing that since you were a baby. If somebody, who are you? I am. Before you put name, culture, tradition, whatever, achievement, and all of these things you're trying to define yourself by, you are first and foremost, I am. Yes, hallelujah. Those are the same two words that God Almighty used to describe himself. The same two words, no other two words. You see, you can't deny that. It's in your nature. It's in who you are. Nobody knows you outside of him. So don't you ever limit yourself to what the flesh is telling you. Your leg may be sick, you may have pain define you. Your pocket may not be full. That doesn't define you. You may be raped. That was the body that was messed up. But the real you is still you. You are. I am. I am. You see, that means the one who said he knew you before you were formed you and him, you were together. Yes, yes. You were part of him before he puts you in the flesh. You are a chip of the block. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You are a 
breath breathed into the earthen vessel made a living soul. You are a divine, say after me, I am, I am. a divine being. Divine. Come on, say it like you mean, say I am, I am. a divine being. divine being. If you know that, and you understand that, wow, there is no limit to what you can do. You know, let me say it this way. If he knew you before you came to earth, you belong to him, you are a partaker of his nature. In other words, everything that are true of him are true of you. I leave you to figure that out. If everything that are true of him are true of you, then my question is this, how do we end up here? How do we go here? How? Let's see the scripture. In the book of Romans, it's pretty clear. Did I tell you that Jesus' challenge with the disciples, with those that are close to him, is that they never understood the level of authority and the power that is given to them. They lost their identity. They are struggling with things they shouldn't be struggling about. And that frustrates him sometimes. How long am I gonna be with you? You can't even cast that out. You can't even do this. But guess what? We are stepping into the age that we can, and it is possible, and we will operate in the fullness of the authority that is expected of us. If you believe that, I will say amen to that. Chapter eight, I read from verse 19. Now, let's read very carefully. I'm reading New Living, uh, uh, New King James translation. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Jesus. My God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen. Here are the facts from that scripture. Number one, the world, your world, your world, wherever you find yourself, your sphere of influence is waiting for your manifestation. Not just as John, or Thaddeus, or African, or American, or black, or white. It doesn't matter. All those that don't matter. They are waiting for your manifestation as a true son of God. A chief of the blood. In the fullness of the power and the authority. Your world is waiting for them. They are expecting you to manifest in your true identity as a true child of God. And until you show up, nothing changes. In actual fact, you're going to be wailing and crying along with your world. Whereas, you are a deliverer among them. Number two, you were subjected to futility. You and I, God deliberately subdued us. The Bible says not willingly, say, but by him, God Almighty, who subjected us. Why? So that our hope can be in him. Amen. Amen. You see, the word futility means ineffectiveness. Toiling and struggling to become not living up to expectation. God deliberately did that. He subjected you and I to futility that our hope might be in him. You know, you see, one of my favorite scriptures, you know, was in the Bible when God began to tell the children of Israel. I mean, it's a story, not the scripture now. It's a story. 
And God told Moses, he said, you know what, I'm going to send you to this strange land, but this is how I'm going to do. You know, the strangers that occupied the land, I will not drive them out at once. But as you begin to mature, live up to my expectation, I will gradually flush them out. You see, when God subjected you to futility, he wasn't expecting that you would submit to that futility. But for as long as your hope is in him and you yield yourself to him, then he releases more of you to you so that you can be as he is, so that you can now do some things, some folks, they didn't even expect that you'd be able to do. Otherwise, Jesus would have been lying when he said, oh my God, you see me do this? Or even greater things than I did, you will do. But it doesn't just happen like that. The last point in that scripture, I like it. Verse 21, it says, there is a glorious liberty for true children of God. Freedom. Freedom to become. To be. It says we shall be delivered from the corruption because there is a glorious liberty. There is that moment of manifestation, of becoming what God expects you to be. Wow! How beautiful that can be. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's what you have having in your life. That's why when Jesus Christ is sitting by the right hand of the Father, Holy Spirit wasn't sitting by the left. He's here to help you be that. He wants you to take you to your perfect state. The I am state. The divine state. And I am confident that someone shall get there tonight. I don't know who that, who's that person I'm talking about. Oh yeah. He says you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. It takes power. Power is divine enablement, divine ability of God that comes upon us to become. Then you can fulfill my purpose for you, the purpose for which I ordained you, the one that I knew you to be before you came to the earth. He's here to take us to the place where all things become possible. Where we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. To the place we can, where we can operate as the true joint heirs along with the Lord Jesus Christ. To the place where we can actually do even greater things. Praise the Lord. Is somebody here with me? Amen. To the place where we can say, as he is, so we are in this world. Yes. Come and say after me, say, as he is, so I am in this world. Then see what is playing out in your life and then go back to the scripture and find out what played out when Jesus was here. Are they close? But the spirit of the Lord is here to help you come up to that level. So that as he is, you can be. If you believe, come say amen to them. Amen. To the place where you can actually be on the same page with the Father. As it pertains to fulfilling your calling, your life purpose, no matter what. In spite of the challenges, all the programming, past experiences, the challenges you are dealing with right now, might be sick in your body or something is not just there and the many of us we are too busy praying about those things praise god you see you remember that story where one of the disciples came to the lord jesus christ said come on master they are asking for us to pay tax that's a serious issue when you are behind on your tax r is going to come knocking your door if you don't pay it on time, they're going to garnish your pay and a lot of things. It's a serious burden. And some of us true children of God, we probably should go and fast and pray and ask God to intervene. I need money to pay my tax. But Jesus did not lament about it, not for one second. How's that? 
He knew exactly what he needed to do. Peter, why don't you go to the river, the first fish you cast upon the mouth, and there's going to be enough for you and for me? Oh, okay. How about when there are so many people hungry for three days, they're starving, they've been in church, let's try and feed them. The disciples, they looked around and said, hey, you don't have enough to feed these people. Why don't you send them away and go get something? He said, oh, no, make them sit down. What do we have? He said, well, there's this little kid with two, you know the story. And the fish and the bread, boom. He, all he did was to thank you because he always, you know, he prayed and he multiplied so many things. I see you walking in the light of your true identity in the name of Jesus. If you believe, come say amen to that. Amen. Now, let's, let's look at Jesus Christ briefly, and I'm going to be rounding up very shortly. You remember at the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? Jesus Christ, now, don't think of him as God. Think of him as your big brother. He actually wants you to think of him as your big brother, elder. You know, that's what the Bible says is you are a joint heir with him. He's your big brother. Okay, good. Now, the Bible says everything he did, there were examples for you and I that we might walk in his steps. So don't think of him as being too far away. No, he's your big brother who showed you how and you also can become as he is. Are you here with me now? Okay, good. Now, just like you and I, he understood the plan and the purpose of the Father. And actually, he's been living with that. He's been observing that. He's been trying to do his best, you know, preaching, healing, and all of that. Rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of that. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Just like you and I. We won't do great things. Praise God. But then it doesn't matter how seemingly anointed, it doesn't matter whether you are bishop or apostle, there's going to be moments that the flesh will kick in. Yes. Something around here at the plan, uh, the, the earth level will kick in to remind you, though, bro, you were subjected to futility. Come to our level. You know, you shouldn't be that effective in this area. You know, you can lay out if that didn't happen, it's okay. God and the flesh kicked in. I can imagine the flesh asking, Are You sure you're gonna go through with this? It's gonna be painful on the cross. What a humiliation you're about to subject yourself to. Have you thought about this? How it will play out with the family? How old are you? You got a mom. How's she gonna feel if they kill you? The flesh was coming. And then the flesh began to get the better part of Jesus Christ. That which he was subjected to. In his perfect state he is God. He is invincible. He knew all things. He could do all things. But at the last phase of fulfilling the will of the Father, Flesh came in hard. Then he said, uh, uh, Dad, can we find a way out? You know, could there be a better way to get this done? So if you have ever felt backing down in doing that which God wants you to do, perhaps the Spirit of the Lord is leading you, go lay hands on those people. Go not take a walk and go to the social place. Now go do this and you begin to give excuses. I'll do it later. You procrastinate and all of that. It could be the flesh kicking in. If Jesus will face that kind of a challenge, how much more you and I? Praise God. You see, it will come to a moment that you will need backups. Someone to back you up. To help you. You want to look around for family, for dad, for moms, for brothers and sisters? For Jesus Christ, there were no family members at the Garden of Gethsemane. The dad was not there. Even his brothers, his siblings were not there. Well, he was able to get these 11 guys to go there with him, but eight of them were not even strong enough to, to feel the heat. So he left them. Then he took his trusted three guys, Peter James, 
and John with him. But they were burdened with their own flesh. They couldn't carry the cross with them. And Jesus came, oh, come on, guys, you couldn't even watch with me for at least an hour. Then it came the third time, you know what? Go ahead and enjoy your sleep. Praise God. But something happened. While he was there by himself, in spite of the flesh, the programming of the world, the feeling, the attachment we developed to the things around us that could deprive us from fulfilling the purpose of the Father, the Spirit of the Lord showed up. Holy Spirit helped them. He prayed through. He came to the same page with the Father. He said, Dad, not my will, but yours be done. Can somebody shout, Hallelujah? That's the moment the glorious liberty of a true son manifested. The liberty to do the will of the Father, no matter what. Holy Spirit helped him. He helped him. Now, if Jesus will need the help of the Holy Spirit, how much more you? So, Holy Spirit is not just there to warm you up, and maybe when we're in the church, hey, I you, know, and the, you know, all of this, we pray in tongue and all that, we fall down, we come back the same thing, praise God. But especially when you are struggling to fulfill the will of the Father concerning you, and that could be the case as a dad. You try to be a dad, but it's getting tough. Your challenges in the flesh are working against you as a mother, as a servant in the house of God. Your heart wants to serve him, but you have these other things you're going to deal with. But if you can create your own Gethsemane, a place of solitude, a place that even though you want others to help you, but there is no way they could. A place where you can trust Holy Spirit, it will help your infirmity. It will guide you to press through, to press through until the glorious liberty of the manifestation as a true child of God is perfected. If you believe, come and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what Holy Spirit does. So next time you read that scripture, you will receive power. What power to do his will? To fulfill his will, his counsel for you. To be an effective witness. As a father, people say, whoa, he's a good father. As a mother, what a witness you are. A great mother. As a teacher, whatever you add to it, the name of the family, your name, even as African American, as white, as Caucasian, what it doesn't matter. Wherever you find yourself in the world, the divine ability to manifest as a true child of God. Holy Spirit is here to help you. If you believe that, come and say amen to that. And that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. Man of God, I'm going to crave your indulgence. You're going to lead us. Worship. 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 I don't know where you are struggling, what you are struggling with me, or where in your life you are struggling, but tonight, the glorious liberty of the sun, you will experience it. Freedom. Freedom. Let me tell you this. I see shackles broken off. Every curtailing factor destroyed. Every limitations completely removed. You will, by the grace of God, be that that God ordained you to be. Come and say after me, say, I am. I am. Who he made me to be. Come and say that you say, I am. I am. As powerful as, powerful. as he made me. As he made. Say, I am. I am. As wise as, wise. as he made me. As he made. Come and say, I am. I am. As able as, able. as he made me. As now we're just going to please rise on your feet if you don't mind. Let's rise on our feet. Now this is what I want to encourage us to do. If you want to stay in the pew, you know, in the chairs, that's fine. But if you can come closer here, just by the front presence.
All right, just come over, just close here. And right to the front. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to shilohub.org. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.